Uh, good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm Matt Rank. I'm the co-director along with Jim Woodward of the Severe Asthma Clinic here. And it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Young Jun, our visiting, visiting faculty and speaker today. Dr. Jun earned a degree in biochemistry from Seoul National University and a medical degree from NG uh, University School of Medicine. He did a residency at Michigan State University and did and earned his his uh, MPH and, and both a, a clinical epidemiology fellowship at Yale University before joining the faculty at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where he's been for nearly 20 years. At, at Mayo Clinic, he's professor of pediatrics. He's a consultant in the Division of Community Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine and has joint appointments in the Division of Allergic Diseases as well as the Division of Healthcare Policy and Research. He's the author of over 100 publications. He leads the Pediatric Asthma Epidemiology Research Unit at Mayo Clinic. He's, he's performed a number of different studies that have been very relevant and uh, leading edge of asthma research. He's studied the impact of asthma on infectious diseases and on chronic diseases, some of which I'm sure he'll share with you here today. He's done a lot of work on social determinants of health related to asthma and other diseases. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to have him here. I think you'll find that he has a lot of innovative research, ways of thinking about asthma that we all may not have thought about before, and has been a, a, real, a real leader in the, in the field of asthma research. So without taking in another minute of, of his time, I'd like to bring Dr. June forward and look forward to his, his talk. Thanks, Matt. Uh, uh, thanks, Mike, uh, for having me today, and uh, thanks for very generous introductions. So uh, today, I'd like to, uh, to share our prior research work on asthma and some new approaches for you know, asthma research. So if you do not mind, uh, you can just you know, uh, hold on to your questions at the end of my uh, talk, uh, because there are quite a few slides we're going to go through. And uh, then we uh, entertain some question and discussion. <clears throat> Here you go. So this is my disclosure slide, and I am uh, uh, my couple st uh, studies are funded by the Genentech uh, Big Pharma, but it, it has no relationship with what I'm discussing today. <clears throat> All right. So the my main uh, uh, presentation is actually bullet number two, three, and four. But before I'm discussing that, I like to in the first part of my discussion, I'll set you up for my discussion. One is uh, our study setting, uh, which is a very uh, unique, which is not uh, typically available in outside of Olmsted County, Minnesota. So I'll, I'll discuss about the Rochester Epidemiology Project, which is a very important uh, the uh, research data structures uh, for you to know. Another one is that you know predetermined asthma criteria. This is actually asthma criteria our own. This is, so Mayo Clinic, uh, the uh, uh, famous allergist, uh, developed it. So we're using this one throughout our clinical uh, and laboratory uh, study for asthma. So, so understanding these two aspects might help you understand better on you know what I am uh, discussing about it. <clears throat> So uh, the Rochester Epidemiology Project, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that Matt uh, uh, Rank uh, probably you know, discussing some point in time in the you know, research work in this because this is, this is a very you know, foundational research infrastructure at Mayo Clinic. So this is a medical record uh, linkage system uh, for in Olmsted County uh, resident. So basically there are two main medical centers in existing in Olmsted County, uh, uh, Minnesota. So right now it's 150,000 uh, residents and then uh, 700,000, uh, about 27 counties. So the basically what it is is that the, this, uh, uh, we call the RAP, you know, Rochester Epidemiology Project, is a medical record linkage system. When patient comes to the clinic and then they are assigned to two number, one is that healthcare provider specific number and the other one is with so-called the RAP ID. So this RAP ID is an actually linking they are all inpatient, outpatient record with healthcare provider. So there, 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 that, that way we can actually retrieve any medical event, either outpatient or inpatient events, both sides, in both medical centers. So that it's almost like a unified medical record for research, only research purposes. So that this is gonna be, allows us to pull that in a really comprehensive medical record at any given point in time. 
So that's one uh, the unique aspect of our uh, the uh, study setting. Another one is actually, as you can imagine, that there's only two study uh, two institutions that are existing. So that in healthcare, uh, really services is really I mean within uh, self-contained within uh, Olmsted County. So that is a very unusual. The Olmsted County residents that go out to seek you know, uh, medical care. So really. All the inpatient and outpatient uh, medical services is self-contained within this Rochester Epidemiology uh, uh, the project uh, database. This is a person, uh, Leon Curland, who was, who was actually uh, the uh, founder, uh, started in you know, Rochester Epidemiology projects. And this project is actually uh, funded through uh, NIH, uh, the Infrastructure Research Grant, since 1966. And uh, perhaps this is going to be really allows us to uh, have really probably the best well-defined geographically defined population in the United States if it's not in the world. All right, now I'm switching here toward uh, uh, predetermined asthma criteria. This is a criteria I've been uh, using uh, uh, throughout our clinical and laboratory studies. So uh, just, just spend some time. This is going to basically a very clinically oriented uh, uh, asthma criteria. And you're looking at uh, some other criteria is very you know, close to this one is uh, probably in the Canadian Respiratory Society uh, recommended uh, asthma criteria. So it's probably very much a clinically oriented uh, asthma criteria. But this is a quite different from an you know, asthma predictive index you might be uh, familiar with. So now I'm going to just you know, make a case uh, saying that you know, this, even if this is a clinically oriented study, it has an, a biological precision to picking up the what in asthma does. <clears throat> so it's, uh, uh, when I came to Mayo and I borrowed the data set from uh, the uh, vaccine research group, and they had you know, very uh, extensive HLA data. So using the data set, we assessed the association between the HLA DR genes, uh, uh, HLA genes and asthma uh, the uh, incidence. So as you see here, this is a, a survival curve. So an HLA DRB103 carrier, so it had a you know, higher uh, incidence of an asthma compared to HLA DRB103 uh, gene non-carriers. So then we have further analysis. So we adjusted for some other you know, potential uh, uh, covariates and confounders. We've, we uh, found that HLA DRB103 imposed you know, independent impact on the risk of an asthma. So after we got this finding, and we went on in a further study, so I really wanted to test it. This association is truly means something you know, biologically. So then actually, uh, we approached it to a transgenic mouse lab. So this a transgenic, transgenic mouse lab, the scientists, and actually asked me that, well, to test this hypothesis, we need to have you know, asthma genes. And then another one is we need to have a control genes, meaning non-asthmatic genes. So they actually happen to have you know, two, uh, I mean, more than uh, two, um, several transgenic uh, mouse uh, the genes uh, lying there. So based upon this, so in HLDRB103 gene is in our in, I mean, asthma susceptibility gene there. So we wanted to test it in a control gene. So he asked me to find the control genes based upon these three criteria. One is using same criteria, PAC, and then it obviously it's not associated with the asthma. That's one thing. Second one is a no linkage disequilibrium with the DR3, and then a reasonable gene frequency or so. So you know, these two actual HLA genes met that, you know, this criteria. We picked the DR, uh, DR2 because that allow us to actually test in DR in you know, a polymorphism. So this is the result. So the DR2 is, remember, is a controlled in asthma uh, genes that be tested, and the DR3 is an asthma susceptibility genes. So this is actually a transgenic mouse uh, study, and this is a biofluid. So you can see that, and you know, we uh, we gotten in a biofluid analyzed the cell count. So you can see here, you know, uh, orange and uh, yellow or DR2. This is green and blue uh, DR3. As you can see that the monocyte count is much greater in a DR3 mice. Most importantly, you know, look at the eosinophil count. DR3 mice is going to be I mean, hugely uh, increased in a bowel fluid. And we looked at in you know, uh, cytokines. So DR uh, alpha and alpha, as you know, these are TH2 cytokines. We expect it to high if it's something associated with an asthma. As you can see here, DR3, uh, DR3 mice have a huge increase in IL-4 and IL-13 uh, genes. And obviously, you can expect it that, you know, interfering at uh, TH1 cytokine, you don't expect it is a terribly high. 
So then after we uh, uh, reported this uh, study, and this is a sort of like almost early, uh, you know, I mean, asthma, uh, GWASA study started uh, coming out. This is the way Fortis group that reported it. And the first GWASA study saying that HADR DQ genes indeed is, you know, I mean, uh, found to be a uh, susceptibility gene for the asthma. So what that's telling you this? So basically, I, mean, I want to make a three points. One is that HDDRB103 may play a very important role in recognizing uh, house dust mite and house dust mite specific uh, type 2 air, air inflammation. Second one is obviously, this, an, this is a, although the epidemiologic data, but it can guide in you know, a bench scientist to know which direction we have to go. Right? So it's just so that you know, which uh, gene can be in you know, a control genes, but epidemiologic data can be very, very helpful. Last one is the most important one. So the predetermined asthma criteria, although it is very clinically oriented in a criteria, has a biological precision to detect the immunology effect of asthma status in asthma research. So now I'll turn to my uh, main part of uh, discussion. So uh, first part, I'll uh, try to make a case uh, saying that you know, association between asthma and the risk of a communicable disease, I meaning infectious disease. So uh, the studying the relationship between asthma and um, uh, microbial infections, uh, there are three prominent hypotheses out there. So as you all know, hygiene hypothesis is suggesting that the exposure to the microbial infections actually protecting the host from the developing asthma. Counter hygiene hypothesis is suggesting the actually opposite. Exposure to such infections are actually uh, posing increased risk of uh, developing asthma. But microbiome hypothesis nowadays is saying that depending upon the microbial density, microbial diversity, depending upon that, actually can pose either a protective or a provocative effect. So what we do, what is our interest? Our interest is actually uh, neither of them, actually. So we are interested in opposite, is interested in the reverse causality, meaning is that the impact of asthma on the susceptibility to the microbial infection. This is the area we are interested in studying. This is our in the first NHR one funded study. So we uh, assessed it, uh, the association of asthma with uh, risk of a serious pneumococcal disease defined by one uh, pneumococcal pneumonia and uh, uh, invasive pneumococcal disease. What we found it was that asthma posing a very uh, significant increased risk of uh, serious pneumococcal disease and odds ratio of uh, close to about seven. So, and when we reported this, and uh, Talbot group in uh, Vanderbilt, that they reported very similar results, and uh, they are actually the uh, PR percent, meaning the uh, population uh, attribute risk of percent is you know, pretty uh, similar, meaning 11 to 17 percent of serious pneumococcal disease that can be attributable to an asthma at the population level. So after that, uh, CDC uh, the, uh, now recommend, uh, determined that asthma is an independent risk factor for invasive pneumococcal disease, and they're now recommending uh, adult age in 19 through the 64, they recommended to receive a single dose of PBB23 uh, vaccine now. So after this, our initial uh, investigation uh, on the association between asthma and uh, even other atopic condition with increased risk of serious pneumococcal disease, and we uh, demonstrated this is the case for uh, strep pyogenes infection, other streptococcal infection, and uh, recurrent and uh, persistent otitis media, and even gram-negative bacteria such as I mean, pertussis. So the, uh, once we demonstrate these studies, and obviously uh, one may uh, kind of raise a question saying that, in a particular, I mean, uh, Stephen Holgate group in uh, Southampton, saying that, you know, you know y y inside of the lungs on asthma is uh, uh, very much in a change. Their in, in, uh, airway architecture is going to be somehow intertwined in a way, very difficult to disentangle whether this increased risk of infections are due to, you know, structural alterations or, or you know, impaired immune function. We are concerned about immune uh, function. So that, you know, to really, to demonstrating really asthma posing sort of a uh, increased risk of infection through the altered immune functions, we had to get out of actual airways. So that's why we studied it, uh, non-respiratory infections. So before we discussing that, you know, when I uh, presenting this data, and uh, the one may uh, raise a question about, well, you know, it might be due to an inhibitor, uh, inhibitor corticosteroid exposure because there's a certainly uh, 
the uh, impaired immune function potentially. So, but anyway, to address these questions, so uh, Paul Overn and McMaster actually uh, the, uh, compiled a very large and a con uh, clinical trial uh, cohort, about 15,000 cohort or so, uh, pediatric and adult populations that are looking at the uh, risk of pneumonia between in the corticosteroid group and a placebo group. So he looked at it, first of all, you know, pneumonia as SAE, meaning in a serious adverse event, which is requiring uh, pneumonia requiring hospitalizations. There's no differences between in a corticosteroid group and a placebo group. And then looking at pneumonia as a not requiring hospitalization, but that's just uh, adverse events. And then you see here, you know, the uh, corticosteroid treated, treated group and a modesonide group actually, actually posing at a lower risk of the pneumonia compared to the placebo group. What does that mean? The meaning is that basically uh, asthma control, vertical asthma control perhaps uh, confer in a protective effect against an pneumonia. So as I said uh, earlier, so you know, our you know, study findings on in the association between asthma and increased risk of respiratory infections are posing following three questions. First question is, is it true then uh, asthma uh, associated with increased risk of non-respiratory infections? And second, and does asthma increase or even decrease the risk of non-communicable disease such as uh, systemic inflammatory disease? The lastly, is there any unifying the framework understanding the uh, impaired immune function and just a broad range of just a communicable and non-communicable disease? So this is a collectively we call that in asthma-associated infectious and inflammatory disease that comorbidities, we so-called AIICS. So I'm going to. Uh, tackle on this uh, question one by one, and I will make a case to you. So the first one is that, uh, first, non-respiratory infection, we chose uh, herpes zoster. I'll explain to you why I chose it this one, but anyway. And uh, first, we uh, demonstrated uh, the asthmatic patient had increased risk of herpes zoster shingles uh, compared to non-asthmatic patient. Initially, we showed that, and then uh, we uh, the demonstrated this is a true for in adults with an asthma. And then two independent group, one in uh, Spain, another group in uh, England actually uh, confirmed in our study findings. And then uh, we went on and uh, the, uh, uh, we demonstrated, that this is actually true for uh, the general urinary tract infection. So we uh, show that asthmatic patient increased risk of a community acquired an E. coli bloodstream infection, which is about infections are 90 percent or so uh, from the general urinary tracts compared to non-asthmatic patients. And then other group in uh, Taiwan actually confirmed that this results. So what about uh, system inflammatory disease? So the, this is a part, actually my second part of my discussion, so then I may switch it toward in the second part of my discussion. So although we have uh, demonstrated uh, five different uh, systems, but I want to just uh, presenting our data on uh, three uh, systems, a cardiovascular disease, a cardiovascular system, and a GI, and a rheumatoid, a rheumatoid disease. So our first study, uh, we, uh, we conducted a uh, retrospective uh, population-based and cohort study uh, following asthmatic patient, non-asthmatic patient, about of 20 years or so. And we found it that in asthma and opposing a uh, huge and increased risk of I mean, uh, co uh, coronary heart disease, about 50% you know, or so. And then right after we uh, published our result, and uh, Kaiser Permanente group actually uh, uh, right there, uh, they confirmed our result. And their effect size was uh, quite similar to what we reported it. But however, though, we were you know, criticized that, you know, well, you know, your result is not a fully controlled for, you know, known uh, the risk factor for myocardial infarction, such as a BMI, diabetes, and hypertension, and even hyperlipidemia. So we reconducted another study and a population-based case control study. So incident, uh, the myocardial infarction and cases and the control who never developed in a myocardial infarction. So we found that in this is the case in active asthma posing, you know, significant increased risk of myocardial infarctions uh, in a multivariate models. So again, uh, when we presented this uh, work, and uh, well, what about you know uh, asthma associated medications, and especially like a short-acting bad agonist, right? You know, uh, short-acting bad agonist is almost like an account uh, uh, effect for you know, uh, better blockers. So uh, really, you know, life-saving uh, drugs during and after a heart attack is a better blocker. Uh, 
So that's, you know, when uh, short acting bad agonists you're going to looking at it, is that kind of, a, you know, can explain to associ associations or not? But, you know, when we looked at it, though, you know, short acting bad agonist, it was not, first of all, it's not associated, but however, you're looking at effect size, even, you know, the uh, short acting bad agonist exposed uh, during that time, heart attack, actually, they're, you know, lower, uh, lower the risk of, uh, the uh, MR, especially among those in asthmatic patients. When we looked at it, uh, entire asthma medication, we looked at it, it was not associated, but effect size will tend to be lower. So anyway, and then uh, you're looking at the literature, and uh, the uh, SUSA group actually uh, showed it, you know, the corticosteroid actually uh, posing a uh, protective effect on myocardial infarctions. What about GI? So you know, this is a celiac disease we uh, picked in a pediatric disease. So th again, this is another you know, population-based case control study. So celiac disease the cases was a biopsy-proven celiac disease, a marsh uh, grade of two and three in children. In this study, so in, because this is a pediatric study, we wanted to address uh, heterogeneity issue. So uh, because an asthma can be quite different. So this t this study we. Uh, apply the two different asthma criteria. One is a PEC, you just saw, and the other one is the asthma predictive index. So what we found it was that the, uh, the asthma status are determined by an asthma predictive index actually, indeed, you know, associated with risk of a celiac disease, and as ratios are quite uh, impressive. But however though, PAC criteria based asthma status was not associated with increased risk of a celiac disease. So therefore, so we looked at it, we compared these two criteria, what was the difference? So one main difference is asthma predictive index actually has family history of asthma, which is not in a part of a, a predetermined asthma criteria. So then you can guess that, right? If this is a true, there's a family history of asthma that play a very important role. We can actually combine PEC positive and family history positive kid should have increased risk of celiac disease, right? That's exactly what happened. So then, you know, the PAC positive and the family history positive, and they're posing an you know, increased risk of the celiac disease. So we actually, you know, went on. We borrowed the data, in you know, a phenome data from Vanderbilt uh, University, and we actually tested. So this is a bipartite network analysis. So this is a square, this is a black square is an asthma, a SNP genes, so the genes that are associated with an asthma, and this uh, sort of a circle is an actually other phenome, meaning other disease, okay? So this is going to be kind of an uh, area you want to see. I'm just kind of zoomed out here. So this is a uh, uh, celiac disease cases. So this is a circle meaning, circle, bigger circle meaning, big, bigger or not, meaning is it a stronger association with I mean, uh, asthma SNP genes. So you can notice it here that, you know, this actually a circle was, I mean, not is a pretty big, and this is a celiac disease. Is it suggesting that this is indeed associated with an asthma SNP genes? And then obviously, you know, here is a myocardial infarctions and uh, herpes zoster and herpes zoster with some other CNS complications also that's associated with an asthma SNP genes. So the, after that, and uh, the, uh, the earlier actual study around that time, and a study came out and uh, showed that in actual history of asthma indeed you know, associated with an, uh, a risk of celiac disease in, in Europe. What about the rheumatoid arthritis? So we, uh, again, we uh, conducted a population-based case control study. So I'm mean, keep saying that a population-based uh, study, population-based study meaning here is in Olmsted County, we enrolled all RA cases. So it's not based upon sample. That's what that means. So if there's no, no sampling involved. So population-based meaning certain study period, we enrolled everybody so incident cases you know, during study period among the Olmsted County uh, residents. That's what that means on a population basis. Study. So that we uh, enrolled all the incident uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, cases and control who had not uh, had uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So we found it then uh, it an independent uh, effect uh, of asthma on the risk of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Again, in our earlier study actually uh, found that this is the case. So the summary so far, uh, despite the counter-regulatory relationship between TH1, TH2 cells, and there is an evidence suggesting that an asthma as a TH2 condition that uh, might uh, potentially increase risk of a TH1 uh, predominant systemic inflammatory disease instead of actual protective effect. 
Second, in asthma has a systemic inflammatory disease features going beyond the chronic inflammatory airway disease, which are largely under-recognized by patients and their caregivers, even clinicians and researchers. At this point, and uh, clinical definition for AIC is not existing, and there's no guidelines available at this point. So it poses an important question regarding the mechanistic underpinning of such effect. So this is actually a summary slide for what I just presented to you. So in a basically, in a asthma is uh, predictors and outcomes here. I can see that in a very broad range of respiratory infections and non-respiratory infections and uh, inflammatory disease. So then question is, what does explain this uh, association of asthma with a very broad range of uh, the outcomes we call an AICs? So I'm going to touch upon this. So one may you know, consider a pleiotrophic effect, meaning is that you know, one same gene can pose in two different effects. One is going to be an asthma. The other one is going to be some other related uh, 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 pathogenic uh, effect. So there's a pleiotrophic effect. There's a one possibility. Another one is going to be an actually we are interested in immunosenescence. I'll explain to you why is that. But you know, uh, in, in this in a framework, one of the important uh, framework is a heterogeneity, meaning is that not all asthmatic patients developing uh, or having increased risk of the AICs. So there is a subgroup, so meaning is a heterogeneity. So why are we interested in immunosenescence? So you can imagine that when we found it, you know, very broad range of, I mean, uh, respiratory and non-respiratory in, uh, inflammatory disease and in association with asthma. So I've been searching uh, through the literature after literature. What explained this? Uh, but I couldn't find any single mechanism explaining why the asthma posing such a thing. So one time, so 2013, actually, uh, Zog uh, Garanzi, uh, he used to be at Mayo Clinic and right now he's at Stanford. He's a very uh, well-known immunologist. He wrote actually a Nature uh, Immunology Review paper. He actually uh, discussed about the cardinal features of the immunosenescence. He's listed here. So one, impaired ability to respond to new antigens. Second, unsustained memory uh, immune responses. Third, and greater propensity of developing autoimmune disease. Fourth, lingering low-grade inflammation. When I read it this, it just kind of strikes me I think that's what we found it in an asthma. It might be related. That's the sort of like, a, I mean, idea in that comes up. Let me uh, make a case for that. So let me take a one by one. So this is uh, the case. So uh, this is actually an uh, adult study. So about you know, 60 an adult or so. And uh, they received a pneumococcal vaccine. And we measure antibody titer and before and after. So this is a bipartite network analysis again. Let me just walk you through. Uh, one is, here this is not, uh, is uh, representing asthmatic patient and non-asthmatic patient. So sort of like a green uh, neon color is a non-asthmatic patient. The red uh, neon color is an actual asthmatic patient, all right? And then this uh, gray uh, not is an actual uh, uh, serotypes, all right? Now, you can see that here, again, as I mentioned to you earlier, this uh, not size is a bigger, means, you know, the antibody titer is a bigger, meaning antibody response is a greater, okay? So now, look at this. You look at just kind of, a, I mean, inspect it, you know, just look at it. One is, except one asthmatic patient, right, except one asthmatic patient, did you see that here in asthma, no size is red, is smaller than non-asthmatic patients? So non-asthmatic patients tend to be stay outside, and then the no size is much bigger than asthmatic patient. You can see the asthmatic patient, no size, even you cannot see it because it's so small. Meaning is that you know antibody response after PPP23 vaccine is a very poor drug. So we wanted to verify that this is a truly happening and using again you know I mean a humanized transgenic mouse lab, a mouse as a model. So I want you to pay attention to these uh, columns here. Okay. So basically, uh, transgenic mice we're going to sensitize with house dust mite, and then we're going to actually measure antibody before and after. So we actually did not uh, give any vaccine, but we actually used the intact pneumococcal uh, serotype 14 intact pneumococci we administer, and then we measure antibody type. So look at this one, though. So here is a compared to non-sensitized mice. Okay, this is sensitized mice. So look at this. This is the actual serotype 14 specific polysaccharide IgG antibody. Look at it, I mean, the lower. IgM antibody response 
And this is actually uh, a serotype nonspecific post-positive choline IgG antibody response porter, IgM response of porter. Even we're looking at pneumococcal surface protein antigen antibody, which is a peptide antigen, not polysaccharide antigen antibody response in the IgG in a porter compared to non-sensitized mice. So this is suggesting that is a sensitization definitely posing is a sort of hampered in the human immune responses. What about the unsustained memory immune responses? Do you remember why I chose it in a Joster? Because with Joster is actually is 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 uh, currently the uh, mechanism for a Joster is an immunosenescence. So in a, right now, as I mentioned to you earlier, so both in asthmatic patient, kids and uh, adults, they have an increased risk of a Joster. So this is sort of like a indirectly suggesting unsustained memory immune responses mean impaired in cellular immunities. What about the basic kinetics and basic memory uh, response? Let me show you the data here. So this is a, actually, we assessed that uh, measles virus specific IgG level over time. So we wanted to see that it a waning speed, waning speed of humoral immunity over time is a differ between asthmatic patients and non-asthmatic patients. As you can see here, asthmatic patients, waning speed is going much faster than non-asthmatic patients. So when we did it in a spline regression analysis, so this is what it is. So that, you know, uh, this is actually the typical linear uh, regression analysis, but it doesn't capture when that happens. But here, you can looking at it here. Waning is going to actually happen. It's not happening early first, about eight or nine years or so, but after about nine or ten years after the vaccination, this is the time uh, it's happening. This black line is a non-asthmatic patient. This red line is an actual asthmatic patient at the time of uh, at the time of the antibody measurement. But however, we are interested in one group of kids in, in participating in this study. So those are kids. At the time of enrollment, meaning antibody measurement, they did not have asthma, but they developed asthma later on. We wanted to know that what happened to them. So they are, there's a blue line right there. So their slope is a closer to in an asthma. You can see that there's a slope difference that doesn't seem to be significant, but it does a significant, actually. You're looking at the seropositivity, you know, so antibody, I mean positivity, you're looking at it. As non-asthmatic patient, 84 percent. And asthmatic patient at enrollment, 77 percent. And uh, after enrollment, about 66 percent. All together, and, and not compared to non-asthmatic patients, asthmatic patients, but they're more than 10 percent difference or lower in antibody uh, positivity uh, over time. But you know, as you know that, you as a clinicians and patient, uh, the uh, literature suggesting that even if the kids who do not have an antibody positive or humor immune uh, response is not there, that they do not develop in measles because they do have a backup system called in you know, a cellular immunity. So that's why we wanted to test it about that. So we assessed it at lymphoproliferative immune responses to the measles, mumps, or developed vaccine viruses between asthmatic patients and non-asthmatic pa uh, patients. They received a two dose of MMR vaccine, uh, vaccines, and we compared it as uh, CMI, the cell, med uh, cell mediated immunities. As you can see here, an asthmatic patient tend to have you know, lower you know, uh, responses in a cellular immunity compared to non-asthmatic patients. So given that the more rapid waning of a human immunity and the impaired the cellular immunity, and then you can perhaps, in a, I mean, test the hypothesis well in you know, asthmatic patient might have increased risk of the measles, but it's hard to test it, right? Because the measles are wild, wild you know, I mean, measles infections are very hard to do it. So rather, we tested that hypothesis using in you know, a breakthrough in a viral cell infections. So the kid received uh, breast cell vaccines, and we tested whether an asthmatic patient uh, do have a high risk of uh, breast cell virus cell infections. So taking into account the vaccine doses, one or two doses, and even durations, and actually indeed in asthma, history of asthma posing increased risk of you know, breast cell virus cell infections. So that's on a PR percent, about 7 percent of a breast cell virus cell infection can be attributed to an asthma at the population level. So, Again, in the kind of future asthma, uh, I'm immunosenescence, so I discussed about first the two, and then the fourth and third uh, points, I already discussed it, right? So in a greater propensity of autoimmune disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis and a celiac disease, I discussed already. And a low-grade and a system inflammatory disease, such as a myocardial infarction or coronary heart disease and uh, diabetes, I already discussed about that. So you know, what I'm trying to say here is that what we observed it, you know, both the laboratory data and clinical data, and what we observed it, what in asthma does is 
ideas, although it's, it's not all of them, but a subgroup is, in, I mean, coincide with you know, cardinal features of immunosenescence. Now, you're going to actually ask, is there any direct evidence, you know, immunosenescence actually happening in asthmatic patients? So this is actually an adult study, and, but, you know, they, this kill group actually looked at it, you know, so severe asthmatic patient, mild asthmatic patient, or control subject, they did find that, you know, uh, leukocyte, uh, uh, leukocyte telomere uh, length is actually shorter among the asthmatic patient, particularly, I mean, the you know, persistent asthmatic patients. So then, uh, now uh, I'm going to turn to the implication of our study findings. Um, so then, you know, big question is going to be, if this is a true, is a happening, and this is a subgroup of asthmatic patients, not all of them, then how can we find those asthmatic patients at increased risk of AIC? How can we do that at population level? Not in my office, in a population level. How can you find them? Second one is uh, what is actual underlying mechanism and how, what actual immune parameters actually characterize them? These are you know, big questions. But to addressing these two questions, you, know, you remember when I you know, discussed in the beginning of my talk is somehow we need to have a better method of determining asthma status with a biological precision you know, to define the asthma, yet enabling larger scale studies. So one of the major challenges in asthma research is really deterring in you know, a translation of asthma uh, research findings in clinical care. You know, anybody who ever studied it, uh, asthma, you know, specialist and generalist, it won't matter. You'll find it inconsistent findings across the studies, such as environmental studies, clinical trials, GWAS studies, biomarker studies, even cluster analysis. You always find it. A study A saying A. B saying B, C saying C, D saying D, you, know, you end up, you know, you know, you know what, I don't have a time to figure that out. Why, why is this the case? So then what happened then? Just forget it. I'm not going to apply to patients anyway. So is it, where is it coming from then in this inconsistent result? Is it coming from really in a methodologic heterogeneity in determining asthma status? That's what it is. So one of the larger portion coming from here. So the methodology heterogeneity in determining asthma status and primarily coming from one, in inconsistent asthma criteria. Second, inconsistent process of determining asthma status. Because of this, you know, you're going to end up with inconsistent sampling frames. So what happened is some study enrolled a subject from the specialty clinic. Some uh, study enrolling patient from general pediatric clinic. Some study enrolling patient from the you know, communities. If you put together, you're going to end up with a very inconsistent results. So this particular study, you know, it was interesting though. And you know, how many, they assessed how many criteria out there, you know, in <laughs> floating around. They found 60 different asthma criteria out there in, in asthma studies. So you know, raising this concern that had a heterogeneity with asthma uh, status uh, criteria. I'll give you one example for you, even GWAS study. Very, you know, I mean, precision is a key aspect, right? And uh, depending upon what definition you're using, it, right? What definition you're using it, you're going to end up with different asthma susceptibility to genes here. So this is not only a matter for you know, asthma research, actually is a problem in asthma care as well. You know? So uh, Dennis Ownby uh, reported it, you know, uh, the prevalence of under undiagnosed asthma. We're talking about undiagnosed asthma, okay? So prevalence of undiagnosed asthma among high schoolers in about seven to eight percent. So in this country, in asthma prevalence is what? 10 to 15 percent of kids? Seven to eight percent, you know, undiagnosed asthma out there. And this is, I mean, you know, high schoolers. Even worse in a preschoolers, right, as you know. So preschoolers, age one and five. So in a very uh, well-regarded, I mean, asthma researcher, Hans Biscard and Sen Zappler conducted this study a long time ago. So it's uh, actually a uh, telephone survey study, a very large study, 9,000 uh, in Europe and uh, in uh, uh, U.S. 32 percent of the kids, uh, one to five, reported recurrent respiratory symptoms and 28% of them weekly symptoms. But among those, only 20% had an asthma diagnosis. Only 10% received an you know, anticortic steroid, and they concluded striking lack of an in international consensus on asthma diagnosis and treatment. 
What about the NIH recommendation? So 2012 NHLBI workshop convened it, and they actually recommended uh, the core as core and supplementary you know, outcome measures, but they uh, they did not they did not discuss the recommended asthma criteria in ascertainment process and even choice of sampling of frames. So that that been you know, undefined it, and that are permitting inconsistent uh, practices that continued. 2014 uh, Berkshire cohort workshop in NIH convened it, and they acknowledged it. Is really sort of a, uh, the difficulty, I mean, accurate and efficient asthma ascertainment is a major in impediment to the asthma research. So we turn to, you know, this situation, we turn to a natural language processing data science approach uh, uh, because uh, natural language processing is, if you're understanding it, this is a very useful approach in you know, a tool for an asthma care and a research. What is an actual natural language processing? The natural language processing is a field in a computer uh, science, in a artificial intelligence, and uh, computation linguistics. It's kind of a, a link, uh, it's sort of a bridging between a humans and a computer language, a human language and a computers. So basically, clinically, what does what does it do is that it's a kind of a bring it, uh, it utilizing in a clinical narrative the free text information, extract information and process information, and then in a classified asthma status in a way identified asthmatic patient with distinctive characteristics. So what I like it about in the natural language processing is is automated, human does not involve it automated. Second is enable large scale clinical studies and population management available and is more accurate than code, meaning ICD-9 code or CPT code or medication code, and uh, you know, premises is really you know, high quality information embedded in you know, uh, text information, meaning when you're saying it. It's not necessarily your billing code, but what you're saying, what you're talking about during the visit is a more you know, important and a more uh, realistic to capture uh, patients what's happening. And the last one is you know, actually picking up the you know, temporal components, meaning is that when certain event of interest occur, it, that's uh, capturing that the timing points is very important and is feasible. How does it work? This I give you one example for you. This is an actual uh, uh, script of a uh, medical record, but part of it, not all of them. So basically, in this case is that you know, uh, this patient has a physician diagnosis, not asthma per se, but a euphemism, you know, reactive airway disease, and that you know, some you know, supporting asthma symptoms. So this computer basically searching that this particular day, this provider actually you know, made a diagnosis of asthma with a reactive airway disease, and then uh, this patient, different date, actually documented has a patient had a history of wheezing and a coughing, and then patient had this different day had a cough is primarily happening at night in a wake or up. Okay. So this, you know, this is a part of it. But anyway, so based upon this actually patient meet the criteria for physician diagnosis of asthma, patient having a wheezing and recurring and a variable a wheezing episode, patient having a sleep disturbance, or, I mean cough and a wheezing, and another, I didn't show you that, but this patient also had a very favorable uh, and, uh, uh, the clinical response to the bronchodilator. So you fulfilled in a PAC criteria. That's how it works. So then we developed it, uh, NLP algorithm for these uh, two criteria. One is API and a PAC criteria, so we applied it. So this is actually a performance, just a result, okay? So, when, so basically, the gold standard, the human review the chart, and then see how in a computer actually in a reading and determine asthma status. That's a sort of like a comparison with so-called criterion validities. As you see here, this is a performance. So the sensitive specific very promising. And the computer is doing as, almost as well as a human's. So we also developed an NLP algorithm for API, you know, very uh, quite uh, reasonable and uh, promising uh, results. So the, and then uh, we developed an NLP algorithm, not only just asthma status per se, but over time, you know, what happens. So, so they're basically, you know, they are developing uh, persistent asthma, or they're developing uh, remissions, or even after remission, they're developing a relapse. So we actually, these are three different uh, outcome uh, results, we compared it to human versus the, uh, computers. Actually, the concordance rate was a very, very close in a 0.83. So right now that we're developing, uh, although this is a very prototype, so we try to developing sort of based upon information, can we really developing a machine learning algorithm, so-called an AI, so the machine learning algorithm predicting in the future uh, uh, asthma exacerbation or asthma related events. So that's what we are trying to do. So then, uh, obviously, when we uh, developed this in NLP algorithm is uh, in, at the Mayo Clinic, which is uh, where, you know, clinical practices are quite unique. 
and documentation quite unique. And uh, EMR system is we using a GE, <coughs> not Epic or not Sonar, so you're in GE model. So then uh, we wanted to know whether this is going to be actually trans transportable, meaning you apply to the study setting with different healthcare system, different practice, different documentation practice, different even EMR system, they're using it, uh, uh, the Epic, and is it work or not? So that's what we tested. So we tested this in Sanford Children's Hospital in uh, Super South Dakota. They're using an EPIC uh, system. So this is the result. This is what we found. Overall, in agreement, 95%. So an actual NMP algorithm based upon our uh, the, uh, uh, original I mean, uh, protocol is an actually it works beautifully in other in study settings. So we uh, just uh, developed it. Uh, this is an uh, uh, NMP algorithm for an adult and asthma. So it's still then performed quite reasonably. So one thing I am going to uh, tell you briefly, though. So one thing we found that the the false positive situation. So then you know in, when we're developing uh, this algorithm, so we run into we're going to actually look at it. You know, I mean, kind of a false positive, false negative, false positive situation. So meaning is that computer saying this this person has asthma, but human saying no, no, he does not have asthma. So then you know. Uh, we have a third party, so third independent reviewers, and they review that record. It turns out to be a lot of time, computer is right. You know, so what does that mean? If your medical records, ten pages, human will be fine. How about thousand pages? It's going to be hard. So you have, you know, I mean, medical records like that. It's, it's just a massive volume, then humans get tired, though. <laughs> so, I mean, computer doesn't. So then a lot of time, a false positive situation, it turned out to be very bottom corner, past mega history is saying that, patient history of recurrent wheezing. Johnny just missed it. <laughs> so that's a kind of, you know, false positive situations. Now, I'm going to just kind of, you know, apply this NLP algorithm to, do you remember in our in original questions, how can we find those asthmatic patients, subgroup of asthmatic patients at increased risk of AICs? Remember the questions? We're going back to the questions, right? We're applying this approach to help us to find those subgroup of asthmatic patients at increased risk of AICs at population level, okay? Not in your office and at population level. All right, so this is a very busy slide, but let me you know, walk you through though. So we have two algorithms, NLP algorithm, both, right? So that we apply two, and then you're going to end up with the four groups, right? So group one, remember group one. So group one is met the both criteria, PEC positive, API positive. Group two met only one criteria, PEC positive. Group three, only API positive. Group four, non-asthmatic patient. Make sense, right? Two criteria applied, you're going to end up with uh, four groups. Then, you know, we apply this NLP algorithm to this uh, birth cohort, 1997-2007, Olmsted County birth cohort, but, you know, uh, a larger number is, is, is you know, 8,000, a little over 8,000 uh, birth cohort. We applied it. And then the, 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 our premises is whether this is going to be a fine, very unique asthmatic patient with a distinctive uh, characteristics, uh, particularly at the risk of an AICs. So look at this. So this is social demographic characteristic. You can right away and, uh, recognize that. You know, asthmatic patients are more like a male predominance, as you all know that, right? So compared to non-asthmatic patients. Look at this. So the group, uh, you know, family history of asthma and other atypic conditions and atypies much more prevalent among asthmatic patients, particularly in you know, group ones. You look at in asthma outcome, you know, asthma exacerbations and uh, persistent asthma, you know, uh, frequencies much greater among you know, a group one uh, uh, children compared to even the other two groups. These are our interest, right? So this is basically our prime interest. So then we're looking at, you know, incident, I mean, uh, frequency of infection. Look at the pneumonia. And obviously, asthmatic patient overall, higher prevalence and a frequency than a non-asthmatic patient. But look at this group one, though, compared to the other two asthmatic patients. Pneumonia, strep infection, P tubes, you know, pertussis, a viral infection, shingles, and even appendicitis, and in you know, a celiac disease, this group one posing highest risk of actually uh, infectious disease and inflammatory disease. 
So now we wanted to test it. So that's in our human analysis, right? So human analysis, we're looking for some variables we, we, we are analyzing in a way that we are interested in. So that's perhaps in a bias. So we wanted to do actually machine-based, sort of like unsupervised uh, the in a cluster analysis. So this is actually 8,000 same kits. So now in a let in a data speak itself and the computer say itself. So we basically saying that we programmed in a way in a computers. Can you find any distinctive cluster of a subgroup group of you know patients and then tell us about who they are? So then eventually what happened is that here is a three cluster of a variable one, two, and three uh, cluster variable. If this is going to be, I mean, what we are saying is, I mean, what we are saying is, I mean, uh, postulating is uh, correct. These infections are all get together, right? So it's not spread around, I mean, I mean, I mean all, all over. These are clustered together. And there's some other in a variable, like, as I mentioned earlier, family history, other atopic conditions, and as poor asthma outcome, they are all together. So these are all together under this, you know, variable cluster, meaning that these variables are reflecting the same underlying construct we hypothesizing as asthma. So then, obviously, you can see that, right? So you can see in this in a heat map, this you know, group, this is a subject cluster, cluster subject one, two, and three. This is a cluster standing out, right? You can see that much more red, meaning reflection of these variables. So we wanted to know that you know, this in you know, a cluster, much more you know, reflecting these you know, outcomes and relationship with you know, our original you know, groups, Indeed, you know, 90 percent of you know, cluster one actually end up in you know, group ones, meaning that the PEC positive and API positive. So we did actually a laboratory in a study uh, for, you know, I mean, sub cohort about 300 subjects. You can see that in you know, group one, two, and three, and four. So you can see that in you know, group one is a very standing out, you know, lung functions and uh, atopic uh, test and even teach to uh, uh, high the uh, tendency, I mean, group one is a very you know, standing uh, out compared to the other asthmatic patient, non-asthmatic patients. So what does that mean then? So asthmatic uh, patients at risk of AICs are more likely to be in a group one who meet both criteria. They have a following distinctive characteristics. TH2 high, poorly controlled and persistent asthma, poor lung function, family history asthma, and other atopic conditions. Apologize, this uh, figure is somehow the, the conversions of MAC, tuna, and then PC might be the case. All right, so this is going to be my you know, a final slide and a few slides so here. So summary and implications. So given the increased risk of respiratory and non-respiratory infection, the system inflammatory disease among the uh, people with an asthma is the impact needs to be assessed, not only just in our study settings and all other study settings, we are I mean, proposing to study it at a national level. So right now so we're in med rank and uh, we are you know, looking at these issues and using a larger data set. Now, the second point, in an individual with asthma, adaptive immunity is impaired, and it rains much more rapidly than asthmatic, non-asthmatic patients over time, and this process even occur before development of clinical asthma. Third point is that uh, the you know, conceptual understanding of asthma from our work may pose the question, if not challenging, in the current paradigm of understanding asthma as just mere chronic airway disease because an asthma you know, can be considered chronic disease with systemic uh, inflammatory features. So we have uh, some evidence actually right now, uh, data, I mean, I, I didn't present it today, but you know, with data suggesting that uh, potentially asthma might be a uh, precautious uh, immunosenescent syndrome. And then uh, clinical here, you, you know, these, these immunologic features of asthma and the susceptibility to AICs and their threat to the health of people with asthma are very much under, under recognized. Uh, by the caregivers and clinicians and even researchers at this point. That's why there are no guidelines for how to manage it, this uh, AIC as in asthmatic patients. So then, you know, addressing these needs uh, to identify and intervene the subgroup group asthmatic patients susceptible to AICs and a data science such as NLP algorithm might be a very useful tool to deal with this. So the finally, I mean, I uh, actually shared uh, some of uh, I mean, your you know, group and interested in uh, what we do. So I share some of our work on a precision population medicine initiative. But anyway, and if there is another chance in the future, maybe I can come back and uh, share with you. All right, so uh, this is a work in a, uh, in a funded uh, sort of federal grant and uh, some uh, private foundation grants and industry grants. 
these are our in the ESMA, uh, our lab teams, and uh, hopefully, uh, Matt, you're going to be at there soon. <laughs> so thanks for listening to our story. Thanks. So if you have any questions. I actually have three questions. Three questions. Three. All right. Right, okay. So I think that's actually, I mean, a very uh, important point, you know. Let me just kind of you know, address it quickly. So the question is that basically the uh, hetero given the heterogeneity of asthma, it's a very different asthma types, and using a philic or neutrophilic asthma, and uh, how can we really, I mean, uh, customize, really individualize, you know, I mean, uh, therapies. So I think to me, it, this is going to be really, I mean, fundamentally, uh, the, your question is, I mean, uh, pointing toward in a kind of a limitation of current guidelines. Current guideline is really one fits size all, right? Basically, you're only emphasizing step up treatment, step down treatment. We don't have actually phenotypic characteristics of an asthma. We don't actually, current guidelines, it doesn't say how you're going to characterize, how to characterize a patient, how you're going to say in you know, phenotyping uh, type you know, features, and depending upon that, how you're going to treat it. I think uh, to me, the, I recently had a discussion with I mean, Bill Bussey, uh, which is an Australian committee uh, chair uh, before in NAP guidelines, and it, that's basically a I mean, future in a guideline is going to be exactly what it is. Depending upon, we need to have actually phenotypic characteristics the first, and then we can decide how we're going to treat it. So that's exactly what you know, uh, they are uh, doing. But now is that you know, really the issue is going to be how can be done, right? How can be done? So is is a certain you know uh, features is already there. So let's say an eosinophilic asthma, non eosinophilic asthma, atopic asthma, non atopic asthma. That's a pretty well recognized. There. Some other aspect of like what I just presented to you today. So for example, do I do differently kit with you know I mean AICs, intracranial infections or not? How how can we do this? So you're putting together all those you know variables. You're going to end up with so many, many, many different subgroups that how are you going to do that? So that's, you know, what I'm, I'm presenting here is in a kind of a more like, you know, sort of a either computation of phenotyping and then immune phenotyping needs to be in hand in hand to really deal with it, that issues. So then I think it to me is a certain way you're going to do it in your office, but certain way needs to be done at a population level. Yeah, your questions. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's uh, you know basically in our our in you know, a machine learning I mean algorithm. So that basically in a past about six months or so or past in a year or so, then we're predicting I mean in the future. So, so I think uh, the uh, we are moving in a more in a more in a toward in a sort of like an, I mean, predictive analytic, analytics. So what you saw is basically what happened right in the past. But we are in a more interested in a developing sort of an algorithm predicting in the future events. So that's a sort of like I mean uh, emerging trends and not only in our group. In outside as well. So.